So Ken, you were recently supposed to hold an event at Belmont University and that event has been canceled. Take us through what happened. You know, it's a pretty simple story in itself. Uh, Belmont inv invited us to go out and look at their new Fisher Center that was paid for, you know, by Christian donations. We went out, loved it, signed a contract with them. They put it on the website to advertise it. We advertised it. And suddenly, two days before tickets were supposed to go on sale, I get this little kiss off email that says, due to recent information, we, we realize our values don't align with your values or something to that effect. So we can't do the event here. I'm like, well, we have a signed contract. We spent money on this. What do you mean? So cutting out a lot of the middle stuff, I talked to uh, one of the vice presidents last week and said, you know, what are we going to do about this? And, and let her know, look, we're not going to litigate this. We absolutely could. If I was running, if I was still in the corporate world, you guys would be toast. But we're not, the world doesn't need to see Christians suing each other. So we're not going to do anything legally, but I want to know what the deal is. And they said it was the, the statement we put out a week before on Pride Week. So promise keepers we see as one of our roles is helping men understand how to, what are the times and how do I respond to the times? So we put out a thing, very basic. This is what we affirm as Christian men, that there are two genders created by God, that he forgives all sinners who come to him, that marriage is between a man and a woman. And that statement, very biblical, not combative, was the reason why Belmont was actually violating the law, throwing us out, canceling us. And ironically, the whole event is called Daring Faith. It's about exercising a daring faith. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Verity by Verse, where if we take a verse, we keep the context first. I'm Keith, your host. And in this video, I want to address a problem that seems to be rapidly rising among many Christians, churches, and Christian companies and institutions today. It is the increasing compromise with the world that even goes so far as to cancel other Christians for publicly taking biblical stances. Now, while there are many things that could be said about this issue, I want to deal with the topic of fear because it is obvious that many, for fear of being canceled or somehow ostracized, so-called Christians are fighting the easier, unbiblical fight of turning on faithful Christians rather than the hard but good fight of earnestly contending for the faith. And while we shouldn't be surprised that the proverbial tares are planted for the very purpose of rising up against the wheat, today I'm going to talk to the true Christian about fighting the fear of man with the fear of God. As always, if this video blesses you, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to hit the bell to be notified of future episodes. Now let's get started. How many times have you said or heard somebody say, we fight fear with faith? And while I agree, I do also believe that in some contexts, it can be an oversimplification to say that. And here's why. You see, faith is something that everyone has. Let me say that again. Faith is something that everyone has. And most people, for the most part, most often misplace faith. And even some of the most compromising Christian entities today are doing so even under the title of things like faith-based initiatives. But when faith is based on the substance and evidence of rightly divided biblical truth and is placed in the true and living God through Jesus Christ, then it becomes the kind of faith that overcomes cowardice. It is a faith that is founded on, rooted in, and driven by the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, which is a prophecy concerning the coming Christ, gives great insight into the fear of the Lord when it says in verses 1 to 3 that, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. This is what is known as the sevenfold spirit of the Lord. It is also alluded to in Revelation chapters 1, 3, 4, and 5. There, it speaks of the Holy Spirit's complete influence over each of the seven churches in the Revelation and over God's end times prophets. Here in Isaiah 11, it speaks of the complete influence of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead in human form himself, Colossians 2.9. It also speaks of the particular functions of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. And notice the capstone of this sevenfold description, the fear of the Lord, and how it is even repeated in verse 3 when it says that his delight is in the fear of the Lord. The last trait mentioned of the seven is the first one mentioned as the context begins to explain how the Christ would operate in this world. Delighting in fear? How unlike the fallen world is that? The word ruach is used for delight in verse 3. It essentially means to smell a very pleasant odor and immediately discern what it is and become delighted by it. 
is like walking into a field full of your favorite flowers on a perfect spring day. Perhaps it is lavender, honeysuckle, or gardenia. When the aroma hits your nose, it causes joy to increase. And that's what the fear of the Lord smells like to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Hebrews 12, 2. Isaiah was prophesying that the coming Messiah would instantly and always be completely infatuated with the pleasing aroma of absolute reverence for Yahweh. That is why even as a child, Jesus told his earthly parents that he must be about his heavenly father's business, Luke 2.49. And that is exactly what Christ continued to be about every waking moment of his life. That is true and complete reverence. It is what caused him to set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem and to willingly go there to be tortured and killed, Isaiah 57. And for a mere human example, just think of the three Hebrew men, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, being willing to be bound and tossed into a seven times hotter fiery furnace rather than to bow to an idol even once. They were thrown in, but then they were joined by the Lord. And when they came out unscathed, they didn't even smell like smoke, the scripture says. And let us not forget that they were no longer bound with cords either. The flames took care of those cords for them. Saints, when you truly fear the Lord, even fire can become your friend. As simply as I can state it though, that is the very essence of the fear of the Lord. So I ask you, if the Hebrew men needed the fear of the Lord to go gladly into that fiery furnace, and even if Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, required the fear of the Lord to fulfill his purpose on earth, how can we hope to fight the good fight of faith without it? So when we determine to fear God rather than man, then we are all well on our way to successfully fighting the good fight of faith. We won't cave to woke agendas, gay ideologies, and the false cries of compromising so-called Christians. We will stand, and having done all to stand, we will keep standing in the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6. When the army set up recruiting stations in every state across the country, it was for the purpose of getting citizens to enlist. And when they enlist, they get taken to boot camp for one reason, and that is to make them soldiers. For that matter, even when the Bloods jump people into their gang, it is for one reason, to be a Blood, not a Crip, not MS-13, not a Mongol, not Vice Lords, not Mexican Mafia, a blood. Am I right? And when the church was sent out into all the world by Christ, it was not to change the world. It was just as Jesus commanded, to make disciples. And a true disciple is one who continues in Christ's word, the scriptures, John 8, 31. Imagine checking into an army boot camp with a drill sergeant asking each recruit what time he normally gets out of bed each day so they can know what time to wake him up. Imagine the sergeant being afraid to make a recruit do push-ups because she doesn't like exercise. Ridiculous, right? Or going back to the gang's example, imagine a newly jumped in Bloods member being allowed to wear blue every day because that's his favorite color. Yet sadly, we don't even have to imagine Christians, churches, and Christian organizations and institutions claiming their mission is to make the world a better place, which we were never sent to do. Worse, we can readily find those that are doing all they can do to make friends with the world while avoiding ever offending, willfully practicing sinners. Isaiah 59, 14 and 15 says that justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. So truth falls and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. And isn't it ironic that it says that equity cannot enter? Yet in a culture dictated by godless people, even Christians are enthusiastically jumping on board the diversity, equity, and inclusion bus. It is becoming more obvious that because of a lack of the fear of the Lord, many who claim to be Christian are afraid of making themselves a prey. But that begs the question, are they truly Christians? Has it not only been granted to Christians to believe on Christ, but to also suffer for his sake? Why does it say that justice is turned back? Which means that injustice is everywhere. And why does it say that righteousness stands afar off? Which means that wickedness abounds. It tells us why when it says that it is because truth is fallen in the street. What does that mean? It means that all sorts of lies flood the public square. People are only telling as much truth as they feel they need to in order to make their sinful cases or to protect their little lives. We see this happening on all levels in American governance and mainstream media. The president, as well as a majority of the political and news spectrums, involve themselves in all sorts of lies to gain the advantage. But even worse than that, the world is for the most part calling good evil and evil good, Isaiah 520. And the wickedness of lying tongues 
is so rampant in our public discourse that equity cannot enter. There is no way that we can fairly approach the issues of our world with all of the lying continually going on. And that is why, above all else, the world needs God's only Son and God's holy word. It says truth fails, which means that there is a rampant lack of truth in our world. People love lies because they are more comfortable and convenient. And that is why, as it says in Isaiah 59, that anyone who departs from evil becomes a form of prey. Defenders of truth in a world of lies become public enemy number one. Remembering that this is a prophecy of Isaiah that has not yet ultimately been fulfilled, we need to determine with the time we have left to put on God's armor and fight the good fight of faith. Why? It is simple. The world is steadily building its opposition to Christ and his kingdom. But know that we can only be dependable soldiers in this effort as we reverence God. We must fight fear of man with the fear of the Lord. And if we don't, we will regret that we didn't because further on in this prophecy, it shows us how God expresses his indignation. And notice how it reminds us of the armor we are commanded to put on in Ephesians 6. Isaiah 59, 16 through 19 says, God saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness. It sustained him for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, the coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Saints, you can rest assured that when the captain of our salvation has to put on his armor, it is an indictment on us for not having faithfully worn and wielded ours. So when that woeful time comes, it will be too late to pick a side. Either you are with the Lord or against him. There is no middle ground. Either you fear God or you fear man. There is no fence sitting. Will you fight the fear of man with the fear of God? Or will you go along with the wishes of this world that is hostile to God, which says, keep quiet about Christ. Keep quiet about the written, inspired, infallible, inerrant truth of God. Beloved, be not conformed to this world. This world wants your silence. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Stay in God's word and God's word will not only stay in you, but it will speak through you without fear. The once for all faith of Christ is at stake. Eternal souls are at stake because truth is at stake. Will you gird up your loins and do battle against the lies that are all leading souls to hell? Or are you simply too afraid?